Good evening, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss another important topical matter. And yesterday, I had the distinguished privilege of watching former Prime Minister of Jamaica, P.J. Patterson, on a live discussing the situation as it regards Jamaican constitution. And uh, for those of you who are not aware of Mr. Patterson, let me just read you a brief paragraph or two um, from Wikipedia. And first of all, Noel James Patterson, O-N-O-C-C-K-C, uh, was born to in April 1935, popularly known as P.J. Patterson. Now, he is a Jamaican former politician who served as the sixth prime minister of Jamaica from 1992 to 2006. He served in office for 14 years, making him the longest serving prime minister in Jamaica's history. He was the leader of the People's National Party from 1992 to 2006. And Patterson served as a member of parliament for the constituency of West Southeastern Southeastern from 1970 to 1980, when he lost to Euphemia Williams of the Jamaican Labour Party, and again from 1989 to 1993. Following a constituency reorganization, he served as the MP for Westmoreland Eastern from 1993 to 2006. He retired from all of these positions in January 2006. So Mr. Patterson is a long serving Jamaican politician, Jamaican statesman, and he is internationally respected and internationally renowned. Now, Mr. Patterson is a politician, but trained in law. Now, the fact of the matter is that he was invited by the University of the West Indies at the Norman Manley, uh, Norman Manley Law School, to be specific, to, um, I guess, to you know, give his judgment and his learned um, understanding of the Jamaican constitution. For those of you who are not aware also, Jamaica is transitioning into becoming a constitutional or parliamentary republic. Um, from the what is known now as the constitutional monarchy in which the king, King Charles III, is the head of state. Yes, when Jamaica obtained its independence in 1962, it never became fully independent, right? It became a constitutional monarch, a monarchy, um, as it were. And we have remained to this day and has that dubious title of a constitutional monarchy. Now, Mr. Patterson was giving his opinions, his judgments on, you know, the present constitution under the, uh, the uh, under the constitutional monarchy, and also the constitution that needs to be reformed in preparation for our parliamentary republic. Now, let me just open up with some things because people are online and they are buzzed with comments that Mr. Patterson is suggesting that we should not accept double citizens, uh, particularly people who are seeking to run for high positions in Jamaica, such as prime minister and those who are, want to sit on, you know, on the, on the courts or very high and sensitive positions. Mr. Patterson is of the belief that people should have a single citizenship as opposed to dual citizenship. And that is his opinion, right? Because Mr. Patterson is not about the law. And that's one of the things we have to understand that Mr. Patterson as a former prime minister is intimating and is expressing his opinion. And we have, because we are a democracy, we have to learn to respect people's judgments and their opinions. However, the the constitution, which is the supreme law of the land as it stands in section 39 and 40, does allow um, the double citizenship. It does allow leaders, including members of parliament, um, who have dual citizenship to sit in parliament and should be actively involved in Jamaican government, right, as it stands now. Now, it does not mean, therefore, that Jamaicans should not rethink that position and try to change that. But until the Constitution is changed, Mr. Patterson nor Mr. Golding nor any other person should, you know, um, they should not be able to go above and to speak above what the Constitution says, because that is a supreme 
law of the land, right? And I think that we ought to respect it as such. Now, it's very interesting when we look at how we tend to be constitutionally minded for things that we want to be constitutionally minded about, but things that are important like climate violence, the economy, we're not so much constitutionally minded, aren't we? Right? Or are we constitutionally minded when it comes to the crime and violence? Do we believe in protecting the rights of our people, the right to their private their, their private property and to be in their homes safe? Do we really talk about the constitution and do we really insist that we should the government should follow the constitution? And does the government, you know, both the opposition and the incumbent government, do they really uphold the laws of the constitution as far as security? the security of citizens are, citizens are concerned, but we tend to be more interested, interested in those who have dual citizenship and those who might not. You know, Jamaica is a very, very strange place to live. But let us listen to the learned Mr. Patterson as he speaks about dual citizenship. I'm going to share what he says as I joined in yesterday when he was making his live speech. So let's go there. And it says here a reasoning with the most honorable P.J. Patterson about the Jamaican constitution. So I would allow you to listen. Please listen to what Mr. Patterson has to say. The British Commonwealth, as it was in 1962, no longer exists. We are now in the Commonwealth of Nations. Once the monarch goes, so must disappear any concept of a shared common allegiance. We changed in 1993 the constitutional rights to citizenship by descent by making sure that women were placed as mothers on equal footing with men as their fathers. And so some people are not only of Jamaican descent by birth, but also entitled to descent to Jamaican citizenship by their descent of their motherhood. Uh, in my view, and this is in the report, which I support, no valid reason exists for maintaining the provisions pertaining to a Commonwealth citizen other than a citizen of Jamaica who is resident for at least 12 months to be eligible for parliamentary office. The qualifications must be based, in my view, on Jamaican citizenship. I don't want to cause any confusion. Citizens of the Commonwealth are at the present time legally entitled to sit in the House or the Senate. I am deliberately confining my remarks to the constitutionality of any such position. Political considerations are well above my grade in the pavilion. It is my considered view that Section 40 should not be confined to parliamentarians, but extended. In my time, there were two appointments I had to make. The people disclosed to me that they held the citizenship of another country. I told them, not putting any pressure on you, you have a choice. Renounce and stay where you are. Or 
if you want to accept this position because of its sensitivity, you have to renounce. Both without hesitation proceeded to renounce and were duly appointed to their positions. There are some positions that I think have to make it clear that allegiance is to Jamaica alone. For example, the chief of staff. Otherwise, you're exposing the person to charges of treason. The permanent secretary and members of the defense board. I raise without making any proposal, we have to look at questions of persons like the Chief Justice, like the President of the Court of Appeal, like our electoral commissioners and the Director of Elections. All of these require further national scrutiny and discussion and would apply to further appointments as existing conditions of judges cannot be altered to their disadvantage while serving on the bench. I am not moving into the political arena, but I think I have to grow Okay, Mr. Patterson has just spoken and as he suggested, giving uh, has given his views, right? Um, it is not the law. And that is what I expected Mr. that Mr. Patterson would have done, that Mr. Patterson would have cited sections uh, 39 and sections 40 of the constitution and would have given an understanding an interpretation of such, but he's giving his opinion, um, his value judgment on what he thinks is in Jamaica's best interest. And that might be so in terms of being an idealistic person, because that is what he's suggesting, that ideally that should be that, you know, people who are seeking those high positions perhaps should be of Jamaican citizens, citizenship and should not have any dual or multiple citizenship. However, we are living in a global village and the policies also, some of which, you know, Mr. Patterson signed off to, right? And signed off on, and which created a lot of Jamaicans to have migrated. And we have seen where the best of the best, right? The, the creme de la creme have left the island. And we are left with a lot of people who are not as competent um, to say the least. And we also need the skills and the knowledge and the um, the sort of dexterity of the, um, the, the, geop the geopolitical understanding, the economic understanding of our um, diaspora who have garnered a lot of, you know, knowledge and understanding and awareness of the world in which we live and how they perhaps could, um, you know, apply their skills to make Jamaica a better place. So I think in light of the 21st century, we're not living in 1962. And that is what Mr. Patterson has to understand. When we first started our nation, and we thought that we would have been on the road to prosperity, right, and full emancipation. Now, I understand that Mr. Patterson is the only surviving person who was physically at the place, you know, where the constitution was signed. That is my understanding. You know, somebody can correct me, but he was in England, wherever that the constitution was signed, he was there. And, you know, we have persons like the Orlando Pattersons, among other Jamaican intellectuals at the time. I'm not sure if they still would make such a declaration, but they have said that we were betrayed when we got our so-called independence in 1962, or polit political independence from Great Britain. Because obviously we are still under the title of a constitutional monarchy. And we see where the governor general who represents the King of England, right? He has this humongous, right? This huge amount of power 
uh, that he can wield over society. In fact, the governor general does not pay taxes, right? And his salary is what? About over 30 million, thereabout, and he does not have to pay any taxes and he's exempt and he's immune from a lot of the Jamaican laws, you know, whether you like it or not. And so the fact of the matter is that, you know, these people have been betraying us from day one, right? We do not think that our politicians have been, even when they were, you know, single, they had only single citizenship, many of them have betrayed us. And that is my, I don't think that betrayal or treason only comes from people with dual citizenship. Also, the fact is that many of our politicians are involved with international organizations, right? And I don't have to call them out and that they are bona fide members of these organizations. I did call out Marlene Malakou Fort that she is a bona fide member of the World Economic Forum and she has sworn oath to that institution. How can she be a sitting member of parliament and also even though she might not have dual citizenship, but she is committed to that organization and the ethos of that particular organization in terms of you, you'll have nothing and be happy, right? Um, we don't want somebody like that on our you know, in our parliament. And and I'm sure Marley Marlowe Court is not the only person who is, you know, affiliated with global institutions, right? And a lot of time these comes with oaths, right? That they have and in many times you have to put country above these so-called fraternities or sororities, whatever you want to call them, right? That is the reality of the world in which we live. So it does not have anything to do with dual citizenship or um, single citizenship. In fact, I would think that most of our prime ministers um, have been, they weren't, they didn't have dual citizenship and look at where Jamaica is at the moment. And Mr. Patterson spoke about the two members uh, that he wanted to appoint and that they renounced their citizenship because they had then dual citizenship and he told them that they had a choice is either they would renounce the citizenship or, or and um, accept the position or move on to something else. And they decided to renounce their citizenship. Now, Jamaica is in a crisis at the moment. And I think that we are in a crisis of effective leadership and governance. And one would have expected Mr. Patterson, almost approaching 90 years old, I'm not sure if he's at 90, but yeah, he should be within that age group. And when we listen to Mr. Patterson, it does not, he did not give you an understanding of the things that he did and perhaps some of the mistakes that he made and how we can correct the situation moving forward. All we hear from these former prime ministers, they tend to tell us of how wonderful they are. They paint this lovely and this ro romanticized view of their stewardship over the Jamaican economy. And a lot of what they say are half-truths, right? And we know that Mr. Patterson, you know, during his 12 years of leadership of the of, of, of being prime minister in Jamaica, things were not rosy and the economy collapsed, right? Particularly during the years of the 1990s, right? Our economy was totally devastated and we have not seen a return of the manufacturing base from that era. Now, I can't understand for the life of me how these prime ministers, including Prime Minister uh, Golding, who was in attendance at the University of the West Indies at the Norman Manley Law School, I do not understand how they think Jamaica being an economically dependent country can become fully free. And he's suggesting that, you know, if we should gain the status of becoming a republic tomorrow, that that will solve all our problems or most of our problems and we just become fully free. Now, that's not, that probably is fully free in name and not in substance. And do you really want to be, just come become fully free in name? and not really in substance, Mr. Patterson. I think Jamaicans would like to become fully free in substance, both in name and in substance. And right now, I don't think, based on listening to what Mr. Patterson had to say yesterday, I, I barely was able to really gain something of substance that came from Mr. Patterson's mouth. 
somebody who should have garnered a huge amount of experience. I did not see that coming out of his dialogue with the people there, the audience at the Norman Manley Law School yesterday. So I don't know. I think that Mr. Patterson needs to understand. He says that he did not say the law was a shackle. That comment did not, he, that's not what he meant or he did not say that. Uh, but the fact of the matter in the way in which he's behaving as if he is the authority on, on dual citizenship and what he thinks and in his view, we are not depending, Mr. Patterson, on your view, right? You probably can express and interpret the constitution from an objective point of view, and then you can give us your opinion. You can say, this is what the constitution says. This is this is what I sh would like Jamaica to aspire towards becoming, but you cannot suggest you, sh you should, first of all, not be ambiguous as you were. You should have made your statement ambiguous in an ambiguous, unambiguous manner, right? That Jamaicans can be sure that according to what the Constitution says, this is what is allowed or not allowed. In my view, then you can say, in my view, I agree or I disagree with the utterances or the statements coming from the, the Constitution, right? But you cannot just go up on a platform, right? A large platform that you got yesterday and said in my view, right? Yes, we should care about your view because you are, you have the rights, you are a democratic citizen, right? You live in a democratic society. So you have all rights to express, to articulate your views. But I think Mr. Patterson, that you should have really interpreted and you could have cited the sections of the constitutions the Constitution, the Jamaican Constitution, which supports dual citizenship. Now, many people also are putting or attaching Mark Golding's name to his pronouncements that Mark Golding should listen to Mr. Patterson because Mark Golding is not the only person in Parliament with dual citizenship. And that is why I think Jamaicans are so much paranoid at the moment. They're obsessed with this Mark Golding situation. And I'm not suggesting that if there were a rule that we should not follow the rule. My understanding is that we should follow the law and the constitution is the supreme law of the land, right? Do you know what supreme means? There is nothing above it. And Mr. Patterson's voice is certainly not above it. What we would have expected him to do and Mr. Golding um, were they should have cited, explained, clarified, and then they can give us their um, exalted view of what they think it should have been versus what it is. We have to read what is there now because we are still under that constitution until we decide to change it. Something which I found also interesting during Mr. Patterson's conversation is his uh, interchanges, there's his exchanges with Marlene Malakou Fort, and they seemed to have been at loggerheads in some cases um, they were they were communicating sometimes miscommunicating. She had she pretended to have been correcting him at times, and he was saying that no, you know, he perhaps has a better understanding of the law and stuff like that. Sometimes I do wonder. Martin Malakou Fort is undoubtedly a brilliant person, and I'm sure that she is a competent person. But I do wonder sometimes if Marlene Malakou Fort has the experience that. It, the, what we're doing now, the, you know, the position merits, you know, does she have the skills and the experience that, you know, because we need to have now a robustly written constitution and we needed somebody with years of experience. I'm not saying that somebody at Mr. Patterson's age group, because Mr. Patterson obviously will not be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to, to survive under such grueling, grueling circumstances in, at his age. But obviously somebody perhaps in their late 50s, early 60s and beyond, right, who could perhaps give us um, a, a more, much more prudent, you know, understanding and share their wisdom in terms of where we move forward and the, the, the mistakes that we have made. Mr. Golding mentioned that you know, he um he was, you know, impressed after Mr. Siagas and Mr. Manley's uh, what should I say now, conflictual relationship 
right? That, you know, after that, Jamaica, Jamaica's prime ministers, both on the oppositional level and the incumbent government, were able to sit and to, you know, to, to speak, right? Because Mr. Pattis, Mr. Michael Manby, and Mr. Edward Siaga were always at loggerhead. And according to Mr. Golding, when he was in meeting with Mr. Siaga, Mr. Siaga could not stand Mr. Michael Manby, right? They just did not have a good relationship. Now, some, one of the things that Mr. Patterson brought out yesterday in his um, presentation, he suggested also that in 2016, um, Mr. Edward Siller called him after the election that was won by the GOP, right? But it was a thin margin, right? Remember that when Andrew Bonus won the election in 2016 and Mr. Mr. Patterson called Mr. Siller, Mr. Siller called Mr. Patterson rather, and expressed his concern about, you know, the voter apathy and the fact that, you know, we our politics with, is within the middle, that, you know, you're not getting that majority seats when the person, the persons who have won the election, right? Now, you, all, most of the elections you're seeing now a very razor thin margin and many people are not tur turning out to vote, right? There is pervasive voter apathy in Jamaica and you know, Mr. Serra was lamenting the fact that Jamaica seems to have lost um, out because of the division and the tribalistic nature of our politics. Now, the fact of the matter is that Mr. Serra, after, you know, being a major proponent, you know, should I say, of that tribalistic politics, you know, it's interesting that at that late stage of his of the politics and also his 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 whole years of living, right? Because Mr. Siago would die would have died in um in 2019. So three years after that, after after Andrew Holness came um in as the leader of, of the Prime Minister of Jamaica in 2016 when he won that election. Now Mr. Mr. Edward Siago must have understood that Jamaica was not on the right path, that our tribalistic poli politics was not the best for us and that it would have robbed us um, of the prosperity that we should have had. And I think, this is now my opinion, that we are at a late stage of development. I think that we, they, you know, we have long passed that road. I think that we have made the detour and I don't think that we can get back on the right road at this moment because of the mistakes. We have made mistakes upon mistakes. And when we were corrected, we chose not to have been corrected. You know, Jamaicans like to worship their politicians. And that was the sort of, you know, reverence I, I saw shown to Mr. Patterson. Now, I'm not suggesting here that he should have gone and disrespected your prime minister. He is a former prime minister and he merits all the respect that is due to the office, because let's move away from people and look at their office. And that position is the highest position in the land. So definitely he merits respect, but this worshipful in terms of not asking him some hard questions in terms of why, why did he do a lot of what he did? Um, if he's making all of these, you know, um, grandiose statements about where we should be and what we should not do, you know, all of these recommendations that he was in office. Now, I'm not suggesting now that Mr. Patterson was going to do everything that was right because he is a man and we all are flawed human beings. But the policies of Mr. Patterson in his during his tenure as prime minister, I do not think that those policies were strong, formidable policies that moved Jamaica in the right direction. And why did he not know that then? Right, I'm sure he would have spoken at the time to Mr. Manley uh, before he died, and Mr. Manley would have proffered his, you know, um, expertise and years of wisdom. But did we listen? Did he listen? And he just carried on. And successive politicians have done the same to Jamaica's detriment. And right now they're just there, you know, the politicians, and they're making their big bucks in their retirement while Jamaicans are suffering. So they do not suffer. And Mr. Patterson said something about, you know, his transition, because I think he said in the 1960s, he was pro an executive president, um, but now he is pro a ceremonial president. I am not sure what, what, why the reason, you know, the reason for his transition, for his change. 
something that we need to think about. So this is these are some of the things I picked up from his conversation yesterday. I hope that you know you have learned something, and I hope that you will listen to him and listen to the questions that were posed afterwards, after the after his presentation. But I do not think that Mr. Patterson, at his age and what should be, um, that he should be, uh, you know, the epitome of what a wise person is. I did not see that coming out from his presentation. I just saw a lot of history, and that is what we are known for, particularly our intellectuals, known to be dishing out a lot of history and historical facts and historical narratives and information. At the same time, they are not contextualized, and we do not see the connection between or the reality and the these historical facts, right? We need to connect the dots so that we can learn from history, learn from the lessons so that we can begin to make amends. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you'll join me another time when I shall publish another video. May God bless you and I'll see you in the next one. Please remember to like and to share and to subscribe.